All right, here we go. Ask a Coach is back again. And we have our resident coaches, Lloyd Henry and Maria Simone. And I don't know about you guys, but the first two episodes, I felt like were really informative. We're getting our, our groove. We're a new taping day. Obviously, we got on some new clothes. We bathed. We've done some new things, and I want to highlight what our resident coaches have done since we've last convened. Uh, well, Maria in January took a class and was awarded or was told in February that she is now a level three USAT coach. So whoop, whoop for that. It is an arduous process, I hear. And um, so we want to just recognize and celebrate that. And also in February, Coach Lloyd participated in a marathon in Japan, Kyoto, Japan. So shout out to Coach Lloyd, knocking out 26.2 miles. And Maria just left the pool. So we don't know what she's training for, but I'm sure something is coming down the pipeline because the coaches not only coach, but they are still engaged in sport. And that's a beautiful thing to see because they are not only sharing their expertise, but they're also living it out in what they're doing in their everyday lives. So today we have some new questions and we are going to do one question per episode until we build up a good following because I don't want to run out of questions that people have submitted in. So just know if you have a question that you want to get answered, be sure to click the link in the uh, description below and we will get your question answered when we tape again. So for this week, so this week we have a question from Elise S from Alexandria, Virginia. Her question is, what tips do you have for strength training both in and off season and during training? She says, I never know what to do. I struggle to get motivated and then I just skip strength training altogether. So what advice would you have for Elise? And let's start with off season, because technically we're still in that sweet window of off season before we really get into like true, the true season, which starts middle of this month. So what do you have for Elise? You care who goes first? I never Go care who goes first. We're like way too, we're way too polite, Lloyd. We're both Go. like, you know, it's okay. Go for it, Maria. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I think you know, regardless of where, well, let me say this differently. The question is smart because Elise is recognizing that there's probably a periodized flow to strength training that matches uh, or complements what you're doing on the swim, bike, run side, which is definitely true. Um, generally speaking, I think to keep things simple, and, and we can talk about the specific phases in a second, but I want to, you know, I think that to keep things simple and to keep your weight training, like, or your strength training, right? Because not everything is about lifting weights. Some of it is resistance training, functional movement, that sort of stuff. But to keep it simple and under 30 minutes, I think it's helpful to think about several key movements, a push movement, a pull movement, a squat, a hinge, and then some, some sort of core or rotational, anti-rotational stability exercise, right? So that's basically five or six movements. If you did two to three sets, you're going to be under 30 minutes, right? Which I think for athletes as we're moving through swim, bike, run, it becomes pretty easy. So what do I mean by a push movement? Generally, again, keeping it simple, you could think of a push movement as anything that's moving away from your body, right? So a push-up a chest press, a military press, right? So anything that has like the word press in it, it's probably going to be a push movement. Um, <clears throat> a pull movement is when you're working toward the body and now you're going to work more of the back of the body. So uh, like a lat pull down, uh, various types of rows tend to be pull movements. Um, hamstring curls uh, are going to be a pull movement. Uh, so that's uh, some ways to think about 
the push and the pull. A squat, so there's a variety of different squats and not all squats have to be the traditional Olympic squat, put a bar on your back. Uh, you could do a variety of different kinds of body weight squats, single leg squats, goblet squats, which are my per personal favorite. Um, and then hinge movement is anything that's sort of hip directed. So like a kettlebell swing is a really good example of a hinge movement or a deadlift. Uh, however, with deadlifts, strongly encourage you to do body weight if you do not have experience deadlifting. Uh, it, it, it's a great movement, but it's also a risky movement. <laughs> so uh, if you do it without weight, like a single leg deadlift or something like that, you're gonna, um, you're gonna do um, more good than harm. Uh, core, you know, a variety of different kinds. And so when you're thinking about core, um, it's not just your abdominals, although clearly abdominals are a key piece of your core, but you're also working on hips, glutes, low back. Uh, so doing anywhere from like two to four exercises that focus in and around that core area, I think is a good way to structure the workout. I've talked a lot, so I'm going to let Lloyd jump in. Maybe he wants to talk about period periodizing, but that was like, I think the first place to start is just think about like, keep it simple, work the front of the body, work the back of the body, work the work squat, work a hinge and work the core. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's exactly right. Um, one of the other things I would just say is pay attention to how your previous season went. You should get a good sense of areas you thought you were weak in or that you could have identified as, hey, you know what, I, I really need to strengthen, you know, my glutes, for example, or my core really wasn't as strong as it, it could be. Um, and, you know, pay a little extra attention to those. You're not going to singularly focus on just that, but you want to take stock of how the previous season went and what uh, deficiencies you notice throughout that previous season and then say, hey, you know what? I want to make sure that I address those issues so the upcoming season I'm in a in a much better uh, much better place to take on that season. Uh, you can probably think of, you know, on season, off season, you just really want to manage your fatigue. So in the off season, it's a good idea where you may say, hey, you know what? I'm not riding, running, swimming as much. It's a strength training. Is it a great way to mix it up where you're not using the same muscles that you did for the whole entire season, but you're using different workouts to get stronger without that repetitive uh, motion. Uh, so you may think about lifting a little bit heavier in whatever your off season is. But when it comes to your in-season strength training, you probably can't get away with those heavier weights uh, like you could in the off season. Because once you start to swim, bike, and run and your volume goes up, you'll start to notice that it kind of uh, may impact, you know, your your training volume or your output. You know, if, if you do a leg workout one day, don't expect to hit the track for a speed workout the next day and, you know, hit all those target numbers that you're trying to get. You know, so in, in season, it may be more focused on conditioning and maintenance and making sure everything is working well. Whereas in the off season, you may think about getting even stronger or addressing some uh, deficiencies that, that you've noticed. I like both of those. Um, and I think hinge, I never thought about hinge, like bending at your hip and to your point, Lloyd, uh, managing your input and output as you move and progress during the season. So at least I hope that answers your question. Now I have some follow-up questions because you know I, I am always have some type of question. So what would be the best way to incorporate strength conditioning mobility during with I should say without compromising the swim bike run? Because some people want to still strength train. What would you encourage them to do so that they're not compromising those days? I'll just speak for Mashonda. So about two weeks ago, I did um, a group fitness class. That's a strength fitness class. Then I had the nerve to think I could go for a run. I was able to do the run, but at what cost to my pain level? So I want to help someone else not be in the same situation that I just recently was in. So what I would say is 
how, how do you how do you say that you you got to be honest with yourself with your training schedule um we all have you know this idea in our head that we're all borderline professional athletes and that we can do what we read in the magazines and what the pros do and what we we read in other articles like you know what they train 20 30 40 hours a week and in order for me to perform like them and get this and that result, I've got to do that too. And we all tend to kind of fall into that just dream of like, yep, I'm that person. Um, and some of us just aren't. Uh, um, and the sooner you kind of like identify where you are on that, you know, it lets you get an honest view of what you your schedule will allow so that you can maximize your actual performance. So if you're going to add in some strength training into your workout, I would say just gradually add it in. You already know your work life balance, what you can handle. You know the volume of your swim, bike, run workout. Add in, you know, start off with one day of strength training. For my athletes, I like to start off with basic yoga. If you do a yoga class, that'll get you some full body strength um, activity, core, hit all the muscle groups. And it kind of serves as a potential rest day if you can't get a true rest day in the mix and I get a win-win. If you can handle, you know, one day a week of yoga and all of your training doesn't fall apart, then let's add in another day of, you know, some other strength training activity and see how your body responds in season with doing that. But you have to kind of prioritize. If you can't even get your regular workouts in, it's hard to justify you now saying, hey, I still want to do three or four days of strength training on top of the swim, bike, and run that I can't really even get through adequately. You know what I mean? It's just, and you're only doing that because you hear everybody else is doing it. So that means I must do it. But in the reality is your schedule may not allow for all of that every year or every season so you know just kind of be honest with your available time because your body needs to recover from all the workouts that you do in order for you to actually yield the results you're looking for if your body doesn't recover from the stressors you put on it you don't get any growth all you get is that gray area where you're like i'm giving you everything that i have but i'm still not getting better what's wrong with me and that's a very, very dangerous place to be as an athlete when you're giving so much, but you don't really get the results you think you should. So just gradually add it in after you look at, at your schedule and what's realistic for you to balance. Yeah, agreed 100%. I love that idea of, do, of adding one at a time and then see how that works. And then if that works out right, add another thing. Um, I think generally... Um, so I, and I would just add on to that, like some specifics. I think that overarching idea is a great way to approach it. And then in terms of specifics, like timing of strength, um, we know from the research does matter. Um, so what you did there, Mishanda, by doing that strength class before your run absolutely made the run harder and it's always going to make the run harder. Um, so back to Lloyd's point about like paying attention to where you are and what's realistic, ideal scenario your swim, bike, run is the first workout of the day. And then if possible, if you can separate the strength workout by several hours to do later in the day, we know that that will have a positive impact on your economy. Uh, economy is basically thinking about how the body uses oxygen uh, and how effectively it uses oxygen and delivers it, right? Uh, and so that helps with energy as well. So we know that if we do the strength later in the day, second workout, it's, it's, um, it's gonna have a better impact for economy. Now, that being said, I always tell my athletes, research is always the ideal world. There's a controlled circumstance, there's every, all the variables are controlled for, but we're living in the real world and uh, you can't always do it that way. So if you are gonna do your strength first, I would recommend not putting it on a day that has a quality workout. So like if you're just gonna do an aerobic run, that's relatively short. So not a longer endurance run, but like a, a 30 to 45 minute endurance run, for example, then that could probably go fine after strength, but you just go into it knowing, hey, this is not going to feel like all the other ones. This is going to have an impact. 
That being said, as you get used to string, uh, that should improve. Like, so it, sh it should get better, but I still recommend if you're going to put strength first, not to put it on a day where the second workout is like intervals, right? Like an interval run or an interval bike or an interval swim, because you're going to eat this, you're going to eat the force that you need for those, those harder workouts. Um, <clears throat> and I would argue similarly. So with like mobility, I think mobility goes best after you're done, uh, because we know that, uh, you, you know, that's going to help with the recovery out of the workout, that sort of stuff. And mobility, you could do sitting on the floor. If you watch TV at night, you could do a sitting on the floor. Last 15 minutes of your day is a little mobility routine. And there's some great, like if you just go on YouTube and type in 15 minute mobility for endurance athletes, you'll have ample options. <laughs> uh, there's lots of stuff that would, that would show up. So good. I feel like shots were sort of fire, but I will not take offense. Mm -hmm. Just say, oh, no, I didn't so, mean it no, no, way. not you, oh, no. not you. The person knows who I'm talking about, talking about some know what type. Well, anyway, you know how you think you have 30 hours in a day to do stuff, but you know, I just, whatever. Anyway, um, the final question we have time for today, I think is about core strength. And I think sometimes athletes, including myself, don't take core strength as a priority. Could you tell us what role does core strength play in triathlon performance? And after that, tell us what are some good core exercises to help improve our core? So, I mean, with your, with your core, um, everything that you're going to do in, in the endurance world is going to run through the core. The core is going to, you know, you're using it for stability, your lateral motions, keeping, you know, uh, your body upright. So in your swim, you're trying to keep that long column. You're doing your body rotations on the bike. Uh, you know, if you're sitting up in a road bike or if you're laying uh, on your aero bars, that core is helping you stay stable and stationary. So you're not rocking back and forth on the saddle. So you're transferring more of your power with each pedal stroke on your run. Uh, your core is connecting your upper body and your lower body together. So they're working as one unit as you move forward. Um, so the stronger your core is, it helps, re you know, it stabilizes the whole unit and helps reduce your risk of injury um, as you're doing a lot of these motions. Um, the key part for athletes sometimes is even if you know or you work your core, you you probably need to spend some time learning on how to actually use your core during these different disciplines, right? A lot of us have adequate core strength as is without doing an extra crunch, sit up, anything like that, but you just haven't actually learned how to use your core in the different sports that you're doing. So first thing is probably, you know, touching base with, with a coach or someone like that who can kind of educate you on proper biomechanics in the different disciplines of how you would engage your core for those activities and use it to your advantage. Once you do that, you can then figure out whether you need additional core work because you have if you haven't even tapped tapped into the core strength that you currently have, getting more of it still doesn't actually benefit you because you haven't used what you already have. To, so, um, but as far as core exercises, you know, just the basics, you know, crunches, sit-ups, planks, uh, those kind of things are, you know, pretty good starter basic moves that, that get you started. Um, and again, you know, for most athletes that I encounter, it's just not even knowing how to use your core. Every, it's a great buzzword. Everybody wants you to get a strong core, but you know, few people actually explain or teach you how to actually engage and use your core for the different disciplines so that it's, it's beneficial to you. Ditto that. <laughs> uh, without question, I mean, I think do nothing else. Like, so you can't get to the gym, you don't have any equipment, all of that stuff, working on those areas of the core. So the abdominals, which is not just the six pack. In fact, the six pack, the thing that looks the nicest is like the least useful. Uh, 
So it, it's all this stuff kind of underneath that six pack in your abdominals that really makes, uh, that really makes the stability that uh, Coach Lloyd was talking about, really important. Um, and then, you know, glutes, hips, low back. So again, that, that for me, that's the whole core area. So if you can do nothing else, so like you don't, you can't get to the gym, you don't have weights, you don't have anything. There is so much stuff you can do just body weight to work this core area. But I'm, I am with Coach Lloyd. If you've never done anything like this before, it, it may be worth squirreling away some pennies to get a personal trainer to walk you through or coach to walk you through how to do the movements. You may not have to go every week, right? So this may not be like, you know, if you're, if you're on a limited budget, it's not like you got to go every single week for a personal session, but having somebody eyes on making sure that you're doing these movements correctly is really important. So some of my favorites, so there's lots of fancy stuff. You can go on YouTube and find all sorts of fancy stuff with bells and whistles and tools and toys. But again, you're starting off, you're a beginner, you're looking for the basics. I love a good bridge and any bridge variation. I think it's great. Clamshells and any clamshell variation. So these are things you can go search on YouTube, bridge and bridge vary. You know, so if a standard bridge is easy, look for a bridge variation that ratchets up the challenge for you, but never increase, never, never progress until you can perform the movement perfectly. Um, clamshells, Planks and side planks. So any variations of those, I really like a lot. Planks do a lot of things, <laughs> right? So so if you do a plank correctly, you're going to hit pretty much all the pieces of the core. Dead bugs, love dead bugs. Like probably one of my, my most favorites. Um, Supermans uh, or swimmers, some people call them swimmers. So you're like on your belly and you're kind of holding your arms out ahead of you and your legs behind you. And that's going to work kind of the low back and the glutes. And then adductors. So I feel like uh, a lot of times endurance athletes, so I coach triathletes and ultra runners, and we tend to ignore our adductors, uh, but they do a lot. Uh, so the adductors are your inner thighs. So I always remember it, like if you have trouble remembering what's ad and abductors, adductors, A-D-D, you put your legs together. So it adds together. <laughs> That's my mnemonic to kind of remember uh, which one's which. I mean, your outer thighs, your abductors matter too, but I think we get, we, we wind up doing a good amount of work on our abductors um, and our glute me med men. I think the adductors get ignored a little bit. So simple inner thigh lifts, like real simple. Uh, and once that gets easy, you can progress to the Copenhagen plank. Mm. First time you do that, you're going to be like, oh, what's, what's happening here now? They're pretty hard. So don't go right to the Copenhagen plank. Work your way into it, but they're they're good too. Well, there you have it. That's all we have time for on today. However, these coaches are coaches in the triathlon space. They also coach other disciplines. So reach out to them. I will have their emails in the chat, but if you're listening and you just can remember, you have Maria at no limits endurance.com and Lloyd. That's two L's at onpointfitness.com. So be sure to check them out. Go visit their website. And yeah, that's all we have. So I had a saying the first couple of times that I forgot. So I guess whenever you try beginner's luck, you always win. And only if you ask the right questions. All right. That's it for us with Ask a Coach. And we hope that you've enjoyed this and we'll see you soon. Bye. Oh, 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 oh,